In the early 19th century, as the Industrial Revolution slowly took hold in America, manufacturers found there were not enough workers to fill their mills and factories. Francis Cabot Lowell of Massachusetts wanted to erase the horror stories associated with mills in England and establish wholesome settings where farmers would allow their daughters to work. I picture new brick factories built along the rivers to harness the power of the water surrounded by rooming houses, supervised by the strictest of matrons and widows, alongside churches, libraries, and lecture halls, designed to fill the young women's leisure hours with the appropriate educational and spiritual pursuits. Let's build a factory by the river to harness the roaring waters flow to turn the gears that move the looms in giant cotton spinning rooms and give hard-working daughters somewhere they can go. Let's build a factory by the river where life is not just work without an end. We'll build churches, lecture halls, and libraries so that all can fill their idle hours with higher thoughts and friends. Lowell died prematurely, but a town named for him was built in 1826. Mills continued to pop up in many New England towns like Holyoke and Lawrence, Massachusetts, Manchester and Nashua, New Hampshire, and Winooski, Vermont, giving thousands of young women an opportunity to explore the world. This video tells some of their stories in their own words. My father heard tell of a new manufacturing town on the banks of the Merrimack. He thought of making the place our home, since his limited income gave no promise of maintaining a large family of daughters. From the beginning, Lowell had a high reputation for good order and morality. We decided to sell our house so that we could move there. Some of the family objected, saying things like factory life in the old country was anything but attractive, and New England hasn't done much to improve upon it. But I told them, that Lowell has shown that independent and intelligent workers give their own character to their occupation. I visited there, and I'm glad to make it our home. 
will take in some boarders, and the older children will work in the mills. They can have steady work and good wages. It was hard to support so large a family on our farm, so we decided to divide up for this year. We left Plummer and Luther to care for the farm with Grandma Polly. The rest of us went to Lowell, thinking the older girls and Charles would work in the mills. At 14 years of age, my father made me assist in my own financial support, and I tried various jobs. I plated palm leaf straw, bound shoes, taught school, and worked at tailoring, but I thought weaving in a factory would suit me better. I came to Lowell determined that if I had my own living to obtain, that I would do it in my own way, and that I would read, think, and write without restraint when I could. Father, I want your consent to go to Lowell. I think it would be much better for me there. I could earn more there than I can around here. Mercy Jane Griffith is going to start in five weeks. Aunt Miller thinks it would be good for me to go with her if you would consent. Hundreds of New England girls traveled to the cotton factories of Lowell. It was an all-day ride, but nothing to be dreaded. It gave them a chance to see more of the world than most of their generation were able to see. They went in their plain, country-made clothes, and after working several months, would come home for a visit or perhaps to be married in their tasteful city dresses and with more money in their pockets than they had ever owned. One sunny day, three of us children, my youngest sister, my brother John, and I went on the first stagecoach journey of our lives across Linfield Plains, over Andover Hills, to the banks of the Merrimack River. We were dropped off in an unfinished brick block and watched for the big wagon that was to bring our belongings. We were nervous, but hoped good things were coming our way.
have a very good boarding place and enough to eat. The girls that I room with are from Vermont and good girls too. At five o'clock in the morning, the bell rings for folks to get up and get breakfast. At 5.30, we are called into the mill. At half past 12, we have dinner, then are called back at one and stay till half past seven. I can doff as fast as any girl in our room. I think I shall learn to operate the frames before long. I think the factory is the best place for me, and if any girl wants employment, I'd advise them to come to Lowell. I went to work in the mills a few days after I wrote you. It looks very pleasant. The room so light, spacious, and clean. The girls so pretty and neatly dressed. And the machinery so brightly polished and painted. The plants and the windows are on the overseer's bench and desks give a pleasant aspect to things. There is first the carding room, where the cotton flies the most and the girls get the dirtiest. Then there is the spinning room, which is very neat and pretty. The spinners wash the frames, keep them clean, and the threads mended if they break. The doffers take off the full bobbins and put on the empty ones. They have nothing to do in the long intervals when the frames are in motion, and can gather in groups to tell each other stories, or sing the old songs. with a large feminine family. Most of my mother's boarders were from New Hampshire and Vermont, and there was a breezy sociability about them, which made them seem almost like a different race of beings. There are girls here for every reason, and for no reason at all. I will let the girls tell you themselves. I'm in the factory because I hate my stepmother. We agree as well as cat and mouse. I have a wealthy father, but he is very penurious, and he wishes his daughters to maintain themselves. I want to educate my brother and sister and fit them for future usefulness. There is pleasure in relieving my parents' burdens. I have a well-off mother, but she is a very pious woman and will not buy her daughter as many pretty gowns, collars, and ribbons as I like. So, I decided to help myself. I'm providing for my aged and destitute parents. My parents and my family are infidels, so I cannot enjoy the privilege of religion at home. I must labor somewhere, but have been ill-treated in so many families that I have a fear of domestic service. I shall go to the mill to get some money to buy a piano, as I don't see very much prospect of having one unless I work for the money, and I want one very much. I left a good home because my sweetheart, who is away on a whaling voyage, wishes to be married when he returns, and I would like more money than my father will give me. 
My home is in a lonesome country village, and I cannot bear to remain where it is so dull. I'm here because there's no better place for me, unless it is in a shaker settlement. I'm here because my beau came and I didn't trust him alone among so many pretty girls. Regulations for the boarding houses of the Middlesex Company. The tenants of the boarding houses are not to permit any part of their houses to be occupied by any person except those in the employ of the company. The keepers of the boarding houses will be considered answerable for any improper conduct in their houses and are not to permit their boarders to have company at unseasonable hours. The doors must be locked at 10 o'clock in the evening and no one admitted after that time. They must give an account of the names and employment of their boarders and report improper conduct such as not attending public worship. The buildings and yards about the houses must be kept clean, and if they are injured otherwise than from ordinary use, all necessary repairs will be made and charged to the occupant. All persons in the employ of the Middlesex Company should be vaccinated, which will be done at the expense of the company. Hannah and I helped a little with housework, before and after school, trimming lamps and washing dishes. Mother did the cooking herself, but she was a better caterer than the circumstances permitted. It was not in her nature to calculate costs, and there was an increasing leak in the family purse. My older siblings did everything they could, but it was not enough. One day, my brother Charles said we children would have to leave school and go into the mill. The agent did not want to take us two little girls. He consented on condition we attend school the full three months prescribed each year. I was between 11 and 12 years old. It was a pleasure to feel that I was not an expense or burden to anybody. So, I went to my first day's work in the mill with a light heart. With nearly all modern forms of communication not invented, not even imagined, the mill girls and their families at home traded handwritten letters to keep in touch. I have gone into the mill, and I like it very well. I like my boarding place very well. I enjoy my health very well. I do not enjoy my mind so well as it is my desire to. I cannot go to church meetings unless I hire a seat. Therefore, I have to stay home. I desire that you pay for the seat, so it might not be said of me that I've sold my soul for the gay vanities of this world. Dear Sabrina, you have been informed that I am a factory girl and that I am in Lowell. I wish you could be here too, but I suppose your mother would think it far beneath your dignity to be a factory girl. There are many young ladies at work in the factories. They've given up millinery, dressmaking, and schoolkeeping to be there. I was so sick of it at first, I wish a factory had never been thought of. But the longer I stayed, the better I liked it. And if nothing unforeseen should call me away, I'll be here till fall. I wrote to Brother Benjamin the week after I left and have been to the post office a number of times and felt quite disappointed. Tell him that I should be glad for him to write. My own mother. I received your letter the first of this week and answered it immediately if I had something to send besides words. But I was obliged to wait till payday. I wish I could send more. Don't say you are poor or dependent. You are no more so than anyone. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. To some of his dependents he gives money, to some lands. To you he has given children. So from his bounty, we are all supplied. Give my love to all that asked for me and accept double share for yourself. Tell the children Auntie Mark don't want to be forgotten. I want to see all the children very much. I should like to know how Mary Abby likes the baby doll that I sent her. I suppose that she's forgotten all about me. I'm sure I have not forgotten her.
When you write again, I want a whole letter. If you can't find words to fill a sheet of paper, get some of your neighbors to help. You must be a good girl, and mind your mother, and keep those curls combed and straight. My very dear cousin, I received your letter dated January 24. Be assured it was met with the most hearty welcome, and it was read over and over again. It brought to mind the many hours we spent together, which are now past. I often asked Sarah Huff to write to you. She would be very happy to send a letter if it would write itself. Dear Mother, we received your good cheer tonight, for which accept our hearty thanks. It is all distributed and hardly devoured by this time. Dear Father, it is some time since I wrote you. The world jogs on and we jog with it, taking our share of what life has to give. We are well and comfortable, for which we cannot be too thankful. I wish everyone could say as much. It is almost church meeting time, and I must put a close to my narrative. I hope you will burn it immediately. Don't let this be seen. I hope you will keep this letter secret and write soon. I have been reading this letter over, and I have a good mind not to send it. I trust to your honesty that you will let no one see it, for conscience sake. Please excuse the first I wrote, and forget the last. After you have read this, burn it up, and I will thank you 4,000 times. Goodbye once more. Letters carried on steamships, railroads, stagecoaches, and by traveling friends and family members were also the only means to convey serious medical news. With only primitive care available, mortality rates were high. seek religion. The Lord saved him, but Samuel did not do as he promised, and now the Lord has set his afflicting rod upon him. I found Sister Eliza confined with a fever, and Mother was confined a time, and likewise myself. On the first day of January, Father froze his foot, and hasn't been able to work in six weeks. very poorly. She had ten fits when we were there. They are very distressing. Aunt Heath has lost her little Rufus. He died in January after getting hurt at school. quite out of health this spring, but I'm much better now. The doctor says I have the liver complaint. We received a letter from Uncle Bryant. He wrote that Cousin George is dead. They found that a fleshy substance had grown in the canal of his heart. Clarence, Eliza, and Mary went down to Hopkinton and found Mrs. Savage dying. She lived but three hours. They stayed for the funeral and came home on Monday.
Jason Jeremiah was thrown out of the wagon about four weeks ago, and he cannot put his hands to his head. The horse broke the wagon to splinters in one of his legs, so they had to kill him. The horse, I mean. Elizabeth Jones's second child died on Wednesday of crew, and Mrs. Bunker's babe the same day. George Everett was thought to be dead yesterday for some time, but he revived. He probably had a fit. What a sad thing it was to have Cousin William taken from us so soon, and his wife to follow after. When we are in the midst of life, we are in death. One summer holiday for us who work in the mills. The 4th of July! We made a point of spending it outdoors, making excursions down the river to watch the meeting of the rivers, or around by the old canal path to explore the mysteries of the guard locks, or across the bridge, clambering up Drake at Heights to see the dim blue mountains. It made us leave for breakfast, but when our walk was through, we had aprons full of roses, wild roses wet with dew. So we'll bring roses to the factory, fresh and red and green, so they might chase away the oily smell of the machines. The sweet air of the woodland around our looms will as we dream through dreary times of our next flower picking day. By the way, I almost forgot to tell you, we had a 4th of July in Lowell, and a nice one it was too. The temperance celebration was the chief dish in the entertainment. The chief, did I say? It was almost the whole. It was the great turkey that Scrooge sent for Bob Cratchit's Christmas dinner. But. Perhaps you do not read Charles Dickens, so I will make no more classical allusions. In the evening, we had the Hutchinsons from our own granite state who discourse music so sweetly. They have become quite popular with the public. It is on account of their fine voices, but also their pleasant manners. I think they are popular here because they sing the wrongs of the slave. I never saw so many pretty girls as there are here. Though the number of men is small in proportion, there are many marriages here, and a great deal of courting. They dress up so very much here. Velvets, furs, plumes, bugle beads, and all. When I went out with Mrs. C, she made me wear one of her daughter's bonnets because mine did not turn up behind and out of the ears. And she said that it was OS instead of OK. As we walked along and I saw the beautifully dressed ladies, I wondered that with dresses and bonnets of an old style, they too would not be passable. Afterward, I went to Miss Young's shop to see about my bonnet. I looked over her new silks and velvets. I inquired about the prices and found that I cannot get a decent bonnet for less than four dollars. But I shall not have my maid till I hear your opinions. I cannot 
injured, but my protests were unheeded. When the transformation was complete, I went away and had a good cry. I felt like a child, but now considered it my duty to think and behave like a woman. The mill girls are the prettiest in the city. You know how we keep neat? The house mothers put no restrictions on the number of pieces to be washed. And as there is plenty of water in the mills, we girls can wash our laces and muslins and other nice things ourselves. I told Mrs. C that the city ladies were not so pale as I expected. She said that many of them are painted, and rouge is becoming more popular each year. Even some of the mill girls use it. She then pointed out several highly dressed girls whose streaks were truly of a carmine tint. I could not bear confinement, no, that would not do for me. For I like to go a shopping and to see what I can see. So I won't be a nun. No, I won't be a nun. I'm so fond of pleasure that I cannot be a nun. I love to hear men flattering the fashionable foes. I love music and dancing and chatting with the foes. So I won't be a nun. No, I won't be a nun. I'm so fond of pleasure that I cannot be a nun. I think Ella has a bow. There is one Mr. Ordway who writes to her and she to him with the understanding that it is nothing more than a literary correspondence. <laughs> he and Ella spin such odd jokes out of her brain sometimes. Mary and Helen are most all the time talking about the gentleman. Just the other day they were all taken up with a blacksmith named Drew Sylvester. He is pretty and he knows everyone thinks so. For my part, I think he looks as well as they do. My darling daughter, I am afraid you have got rather too deep into love. It is a dangerous place, especially for ladies. In the case of disaster, they are generally the greatest, if not the only sufferers. Their female acquaintances furnish but cool sympathy, and none can be expected from the other sex. Consult your friends. Do or say nothing you would be ashamed to have your father know. And do not fail to give me all the information. Dearest Sister Delia, 
Are you desperately in love? Are you engaged? When are you going to be married? Please tell me in your next letter. Dearest uncle, you wished me to make certain inquiries about Drew Sylvester of Lowell. I know not your motive in this subject, but it matters not. I will give you the information which I have gained, and that is undoubted. Mr. Sylvester has a wife and child in Manchester. He's been trustee twice by his wife. He's also a man who drinks hard and runs after other women. This information I have gained from good and satisfactory authors. If I could be of further assistance, please advise. Your devoted nephew, Augustine. Sylvester, I am glad to hear. I hope you will avoid being in love at all. Perhaps you have learned more about him since you first wrote. I will tell you some things you did not mention, but the truth of which there can be no doubt. He never divorced, has a wife and child living in Manchester now, and his employers have been trustee twice for their support. He is considered very temperate. A libertine who makes love to all the ladies that let him. You mentioned attending a singing school. That is all very well if you can do so with propriety. But you might better spoil your voice and break your neck than go there or anywhere else with Sylvester. Your only safety is in renouncing him at once. One bit of news I must tell you, Delia. Mrs. Maria Farwell French has got a little baby about two weeks old. Since she has been but three months married, we think her quite smart. Don't you? Dear uncle, I have been gathering all the information concerning Delia that I could. She has moved out of her boarding place because Mrs. C would not permit Sylvester to come there. She said she liked Delia, and she told her she did not want her to leave. Delia said, if I get into trouble, I'll have no one to blame but myself. I do fear she will be a ruined girl. I think what he wants is to get her money and leave her as he did his wife. What we can do now to save her, I know not. You mentioned Sylvester again in your last letter. How is his divorce progressing? You say you have heard ever so many times that his wife is remarried. Well, I think few things would be easier for Sylvester to ascertain beyond a doubt and whether she is married or not. I am not free from suspicions that he has done nothing about a divorce. I hope you will attend church constantly at least half a day every Sunday. Your present and future welfare, I think, depends very much upon it. 
Delia, I must again direct you to treat him as an acquaintance and nothing more until such time as you have certain evidence that a more intimate relation will be neither disreputable nor criminal. If he is a good man, you will know before it is too late, and if a bad one, you cannot know it too soon. There is not much to report from here. We killed our hog Monday. He weighed over 400 pounds. Come home soon, and you shan't starve. And write soon to your affectionate sister. No witness have I none, save God Almighty. And may he reward you well for the slighting of me. For there is no trusting man, not even your own brother. So girls, if you would love, love one another. In addition to romantic possibilities, both proper and scandalous, we mill girls sought to better ourselves. Many a girl at Lowell was working to send her brother to college, but had far more talent and character than he. But a man could preach, and it was not orthodox to think that a woman could. In Lowell, we enjoy abundant means of information, especially in the way of public lectures. The time of lecturing is appointed to suit the convenience of the operative. And sad indeed would be our lyceums, institutes, and scientific lecture halls if all of the operatives were absent. We had John Quincy Adams, Edward Everett, John Pierpont, and Ralph Waldo Emerson among our lecturers, as well as distinguished clergymen of the day. Daniel Webster was once in our town trying a law case. Some of my girlfriends went to the courtroom and got a glimpse of his face but I just miss seeing him. And last, though not least, is the pleasure of being associated with institutions of religion and thereby availing ourselves of the library, Bible class, Sabbath school, and all religious instruction. Most of us, when at home, live in the country and therefore cannot enjoy these privileges to the same extent. But surely, these are sources of pleasure. Some of us continued our learning inside the mills. Although the regulations forbade us to bring books into the mill, I made my loom into a library of poetry, pasting it all over with newspaper clippings. My cousin used to keep a mathematical problem or two pinned up on her dressing frame, which she and her companion solved as they paced up and down, mending the broken threads of the warp. Books were prohibited, but no objection was made to bits of printed paper. Not wishing to break a rule, I took pages out of a half-worn copy of Shakespeare and carried the leaves about with me at work until I fixed the contents to memory. The girls also taught each other. My sister cared more to watch the natural development of our minds than to make us follow the direction of hers. She was really our teacher, although she never assumed that position. Certainly, I learned more from her about my own capabilities and how I might put them to use than I could have done at any school we knew of had it been possible for me to attend one full time. One thing she planned for us, a dozen or so cousins and friends' sisters, some attending school and some at work at the mill, was a little fortnightly paper to be filled with our original contributions. She herself acting as editor I wrote my little verses, to be sure. They just grew. They were the same as breathing or singing. My sister, however, told me that here was a talent which I had no right to neglect. I believed her. It was a comfort to be assured that my scribbling was not wholly a waste of time. So I used pencil and paper in every spare minute I could find. Our little home journal went briefly on through 12 editions.
Ben and Emily became acquainted with a group of bright girls near neighbors of ours. They've proposed that we join together and form a little society for writing and discussion to meet fortnightly at the church. We met and named ourselves the Improvement Circle. I was their first president. At the sessions of the circle, held every fortnight, reading submissions are read, names of the writers not being announced. The largest range of subject has been allowed, and the greatest variety of styles indulged. Fact and fiction, poetry and prose, science and letters, religion and morals. The subjects have been humorous or otherwise, depending on the various taste or talent of the writer. The reading of these articles is the sole entertainment of the meetings of the circle. The interest excited has given a remarkable boost to the intellectual energies of the mill girls. The older ones talked and wrote on many subjects quite above me. I was bashful, as half-grown girls usually are. But I wrote my little essays and read them and listened to the rest and enjoyed it all exceedingly. Out of this improvement circle grew a larger one. And a few years later, our essays were gathered by the Reverend Thomas and published in a literary magazine called The Lowell Offering. We were improving ourselves and preparing for the future in every possible way by purchasing and reading books, attending lectures and evening classes, and meeting each other for reading and conversation. That we should write was no more strange than that we should read or think or breathe. The Lowell Offering was published monthly for five years, gaining subscribers and acclaim from across New England, the United States, and even France and Britain. The noted author, Charles Dickens, who famously criticized British factory conditions in his novel Hard Times, traveled to Lowell to see the Mill Girls for himself. These girls are all well-dressed and extremely clean. They have good, serviceable bonnets, warm clothes, and shawls. They were all healthy in appearance and had the manners and deportment of young women, not to greater breeds of burden. They do not want for me. In July 1841, 938 of these girls were depositors of Lowell Savings Bank with joint savings estimated at $100,000 or 20,000 English pounds. I am now going to state three facts which will startle a large class of readers on this side of the Atlantic very much. <gasps> Firstly, there is a piano in a great many of the boarding houses. Secondly, nearly all these young ladies subscribe to libraries. Thirdly, they have got up among themselves a periodical called the Lowell Offering, a repository of original articles written exclusively by these women. I have read a good solid 400 pages from beginning to end. The large class of readers on this side of the Atlantic will exclaim with one voice, how very preposterous! These things are above their station! In reply to that objection, I would beg to ask what their station is. Are we quite sure that we in England have not formed our ideas of the station of working people? Determined by the class they are, and not as they might be. Of the literary merits of the Lowell offering, I will only observe, putting entirely out of sight the fact that these girls have written these articles, after working the arduous labors of the day, it compares well with a great many English periodicals. The Lowell offering gave evidence that we thought, and that we thought upon solid and serious matters. After a while, the assertion was circulated that our magazine was not written by ourselves, but was instead written by Lowell lawyers. This was almost too ridiculous a suggestion to contradict. But yet, the editor of the Lowell Offering insisted that the name and occupations of the writers be given from that point on. Many of us were resolutely bent upon obtaining a better education. Very few among us were without some distinct plan for bettering the condition of themselves and those they loved. For the first time, young women had come forth from their homes in a throng each with her own individual purpose. All the employees of the Lowell Mills were required to attend church services weekly, but many of us would have attended voluntarily. 
religion at its best dovetailed with education as a process of penetrating deeper and rising higher into life. It was a common thing for a girl to have a page or two of the Bible set beside her at work while her hands went on with their mechanical occupation. I had a fragment of a dilapidated hymn book from which I learned a hymn to sing to myself, unheard within the deep solitude of unceasing machinery sound. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb I will sing. To In the early 19th century, the United States was experiencing the Second Great Awakening, in which many people circulated through various Protestant denominations in order to find a church and ministry that appealed to them. The Mill Girls were part of this exploration and found that styles of preaching, music, and dress could be very different from one church to another. I went to the congregational meeting, for that is the one I've always been accustomed to attend. The meeting house is one of the oldest in the city, and not beautiful, but a good respectable looking building. The congregation was very tastefully dressed. In the afternoon, I went to the Methodist meeting. At home, this is the ragged church, but here they wear bows, plumes, ripples, crimples, ruffs, puffs, ribbons, and farthingales. The preaching was of a higher order than I anticipated, and some old hymns were sung without an organ, but with great feeling. Next Sunday, I shall go to see the Episcopalians and the Catholics, of whom we have always heard so little that is good. In the mills, we are not so far from God and nature as many persons might suppose. We enjoy much pleasure cultivating flowers and plants. A large and beautiful variety of plants are placed around the walls of our room, giving it more the appearance of a flower garden than a workshop. It is there we inhale the sweet perfume of the rose, the lily, and geranium, and with them give sincere gratitude to the bountiful giver of these rich blessings. Through all the worlds below, God is seen all around. Search hills and valleys through there is found. The Still, rumors persisted about the mills and the girls who worked in them. She has worked in a factory. It is sufficient to damn to infamy the most worthy and virtuous girl. So says Mr. Orestes Bronson, who has slandered a class of girls who in this city are numbered by thousands. They generally come from quiet country homes, where their minds and manners have been formed by the worthy children of the pilgrims. Someday they will give birth to our future citizens. Think how many of the next generation are to spring from mothers doomed to infamy. I acknowledge that some of you may be worthy and virtuous. Then we must be worthy and virtuous idiots, for no girl of common sense would choose an occupation that would consign her to infamy. You certainly cannot mean to intimate that all factory girls are virtuous and <laughs> intelligent. No, I do not, and Lowell would be a stranger place than it has ever been represented if among 8,000 girls there were none of the ignorant and depraved. 
but our well-filled churches and lecture halls and the high character of our lecturers and clergymen will testify that the state of morals and intelligence is not low. For 20 years or so, Lowell was looked upon as a rather select industrial school for young women. They had come to work with their hands, but they could not hinder the working of their minds. Their mental activity was overflowing at every possible outlet. Despite the camaraderie and empowerment that many girls experienced in Lowell, feelings of discontent started to form. The mill barons sought to increase profits by lowering wages and increasing rent in the required capital. Captains of industry are we, here's what we call equity, and for you in a month for me, hey! The jobs themselves became more dangerous and complicated as employees were expected to operate three or four looms each rather than one or two. It is very hard work indeed, and sometimes I'm not sure if I'll be able to endure it. Our wages are to be reduced on the 20th of this month, and there is a great deal of excitement surrounding the matter, but I'm not yet sure what the consequence will be. The companies pretend that they are losing immense sums every day, and are therefore obliged to lessen wages. But this seems perfectly absurd to me, as they are constantly making repairs. This would not be if there was really any danger of them closing the mills. The days are very long here. Can I finish work for the night? The sound of the mill is in my ears. Like crickets, frogs, and dewhards all mingled together in strange discord. Sometimes it feels as though the cotton is in my ears. I wander back to the rooming house and to the other girls in the hall. At 10 o'clock, Mrs. C comes in and tells us that it's time for us to go to bed. Some beg for time to finish the chapter, others just a few minutes to finish the scene. She refuses them, good day, quickly, but the clever ones say that they want a longer speech and detain her by telling her stories about what they saw and heard upon the street. And she unconsciously gives them the few minutes she had first refused. I then go up three flights of stairs into what's called the long attic. But they could all be spaces. The most objectionable of places always being left for newcomers. There are three bedrooms, two of which are occupied. I woefully look at the strange girl who is to be my bedroom. She takes no notice of me. She goes to sleep as if I was still in the White Mountains.
As work demands increased and conditions deteriorated, some of the writing that the Mill Girls did for the Lowell Offering started to reflect this dissatisfaction. The toils of my week were at its end, and seated at the table with my book, I was feasting upon the treasures it contained. My reverie was disturbed when a little boy entered the room, handed me a paper. I unfolded it. It was a periodical from the Society for the Promotion of Industry, Virtue, and Knowledge. It read at the annual meeting of the society, the following resolutions were unanimously adopted. Be it resolved that every father of a family who neglects to give his daughter the same educational advantages as his son be expelled from this society and considered heathen. Be it resolved that no member of this society shall exact more than eight hours of labor out of every 24 of any person under his or her employment. Be it resolved that as the laborer is worthy of hire, the price for labor shall be sufficient to enable working people to pay proper attention to educational pursuits. Be it resolved that the wages of females be equal to the wages of males, so that they may be enabled to maintain proper independence of character and virtuous deportment. Be it resolved that industry, virtue, and knowledge, not wealth and titles, shall be the standard of respectability for the society. I paused after the fifth resolution to ponder what I had just read. I thought it strange that I had not yet heard of the society. There was a gentle tap at the door and the little boy returned with a modest request for subscribers to this new periodical. He exclaimed, Oh, happy America, thrice happy land of freedom. Our example shall free all nations from the galling chains of mental bondage and teach the earth what true happiness consists of. Our society already has more than two-thirds of the population of the United States as members. Would anyone in this boarding house like to join? I ran upstairs to see if any of the other girls would become subscribers, but before reaching their rooms, I stumbled, fell, and awoke from the stream. As I recalled the resolutions of the paper the young man had handed me, I began to awaken to the injustices us factory girls must endure, and remembered a song that had come to me once in a dream. Our song of fun had been transformed into an anthem which all mill girls could sing. One night, 
worn and weary after 13 hours of toil in the suffocating heat of the mill, I fell into a feverish, fitful sleep, and the vision of the day of judgment passed before me. The children of men were gathered in groups like criminals, whenever it seemed that their sin were of the same deep dye. A crowd of various mingled tongues and nations passed by to receive their judgment, and at last came the Lowell Manufacturing Company. The agents stood in front of the owners and still seemed to act as their chief spokesman. As they stood before the supreme judge of the world, methought that the following dialogue occurred. Sunday the 4th of May, 1844. Attending church. But I've been informed you were blasting rocks for a new factory. What? Oh, oh yes, yes. We hired some common people to do that for us. But I attended church myself. You must go below. What, 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 what apartment should I take? The one closest to the fire. Sunday the 4th of May, 1844. In the morning, I attended church, and the afternoon, rambled off into the woods. How came you to ramble in the woods on a Sunday? I had no time on weekdays. How many hours did you work each day at the mill? Thirteen. And how much time had you for meals? One hour and a quarter, sometimes less. This makes 14 and a quarter hours total, which when deducted from 24, leaves nine and three quarters hours. How much time had you for relaxation, religious and moral instruction, reading, social visiting, and intercourse with your family? Only what I stole from my sleep, and I was so tired, I immediately had to retire to rest. You may go to heaven. What seat shall I take? Any of the upper seats that you like. No one had time to write this week, or last. Sorry to have bothered you, Reverend Thomas. I, I guess we will all go home. No. Let's take this time to talk about why we aren't writing. I'm so fatigued by this warm weather, I begin to dislike the hot brick pavements and glaring buildings. I want to go home, to go down to the brook and sit by the cooling spring. It makes my feet ache to stand so much. But I suppose I shall get accustomed to that, too. The girls wear old shoes to work. And after working here a year or two, they have to get shoes a size or two larger. And the right arm, which is the one used to run the loom, becomes the larger than the left. Last Thursday, a girl fell down and broke her neck, which caused instant death. The same day, a man was killed by the railroad cars and another had nearly all his ribs broken. Another was nearly killed by having a bale of cotton fall on him. I've been so upset since the Lawrence catastrophe. How dreadful. How many hearts were wrung with anguish. What if we had been among the sufferers? There was a young man who stayed here a few nights ago who lost his arm in the Manchester mills. I was born in Manchester, where my mother still lives with a large family of children dependent on us for support. I had often thought my case a solitary and hard one, constantly confined to the mills, while so many were enjoying the high life. My views have now entirely changed, and I believe that idleness is the parent of all sins. Our pay has been considerably reduced because the depression of trade is great, and sale of goods so limited, we are running the mills at a loss. If this be true, why don't they cut down the salaries of their agents? This is never done. The poor laborers must bear all the burdens. 
We are even told the factories are only kept running at all out of charity toward you. Let us see a little bit more equality, a little bit more sincerity in the matter. Then perhaps we will have more charity. There is far too much of an aristocratic feeling in this town and groundless prejudice against workers. Your industry is to be commended. You toil from morning until night, but do you receive an adequate reward for your services? No. The owner receives too much, the operative too little. There is another grievous wrong. What? The difference in caste which the employers create between their sons and daughters and the sons and daughters whom they employ to increase their wealth. This is wrong. Let democracy be extended to us in place of aristocracy and cottonocracy. Rich people make us work so long and hard and send recruiters all over the country telling girls lies to get them to come. When they get here, they find out how much they have been cheated and many are too poor to get back to their homes, so they have to stay at work in the mills. They get sick and some of them die. Their parents would grieve very much when they hear about it. For poor people love their children as well as the rich. Do the rich people ever put their children into factories? I should think they would if they are such nice, healthy places as they say. How proud they would feel to know that they were doing something useful. Men and women should act in order to gain their liberty. While men and women may have no difference of mind, there is a difference of body which must compel us to temper our behavior. He is made strong that he may be willing to protect and defend. She is more lovely that he may be willing to shield her. Lydia, the women are wronged in every condition of life. We work for a pittance in the mills or as domestic servants. We are barred from every means of righting our own wrongs by our social position. If the high and mighty will not speak on our behalf, we shall face destruction. Men say it is a violation of the women's fear to speak in public. But when our rights are trampled upon, what shall we do but appeal to the legislature? Shall not our voices be heard and our rights acknowledged there? Now, now, let woman keep to her own sphere. Her domestic duties should claim her first thoughts to elevate, to gladden, and to beautify. Women have influence over the next generation, especially the portion of it that will one day be voters and perhaps leaders of this country. Quite right. If a woman has talents which might be of service to her country, let her exercise them in a quiet way. Madame Roland, in the seclusion of her chamber, wrote documents which were read in all the cabinets of Europe. But far more influential were those opinions while passed under her husband's name. And far more noble did Madame Roland appear than if she had expressed them herself. There may be times when a woman will do what a man cannot perform. She may depart from her appropriate sphere, and the very novelty of her position will create enthusiasm on her behalf. Yet happier is she if the thunderbolt she launches return not upon her own head. Witness, for example, Joan of Arc. Women should share in governance. It is our right, and it's contrary to the principles of our Constitution to deprive us of this privilege. Oh, tush. To be happy and to contribute to the happiness of others is a woman's aim. And neither of these objects would be attained by engaging in party politics. If she go at all upon the battlefield, it should be, to use an expression of William Penn's, as a physician goes among the sick not to catch the disease, but to cure it. Women once madly engaged in political strife, and while some preserve their purity and tenderness, Others, such as Marie Antoinette, were led to the guillotine. Though women may not personally approach the ballot box, we can be represented there. Men do not vote solely for themselves, but for their wives, mothers, and daughters. Females who have been blessed by beauty of form and face need not fear their graces will be lessened by speaking out. 
The natural desire in our sex to please the other has left some to adorn their persons at the expense of their minds. In some of the corporations in the city, it is now an established rule to close the factory gate two minutes early and to ring the lunch bell two minutes late. Is that right? I hope the agents will undo this wrong which they inflict on thousands laboring in this city. The premium system is a curse to us. Our overseers should not benefit if we produce more. Some girls cannot work as fast as others. They are apt to be treated unkindly and often reminded that Sally and Dolly weave more fabric than you. If you don't deliver more next month, I will send you off. Tis sometimes asked why girls come to the gate before tis opened if they're not willing to work so many long hours. The premium is offered, and the girls want to keep the old man as good-natured as possible. Overseers may not use the whip, but they give looks and words and fines, sometimes quite as severe. I gave my overseer a piece of my mind today. Well, Mr. Buck, I am informed that you wish to cut down my wages. Yes. Do you suppose that I would go into work again at a lower pay than I received before? Why, that's fair and reasonable, considering the hard times. Well, all I have to say is that before I'll do it, I'll see you in hell, pumping thunder at three cents a clap. What did he say to that? He invited me to resume my duties. I spoke with a noble gentleman whose heart is so full of charity that I cannot pass him over in silence. He is the boss of the Essex Corporation. After conversing with me of the evils that affect the working men and women of our country and admitting that there must be changes, he said, but if I wish to make changes, I can never take suggestions from a woman. There are my sisters. Will you not hang your head in disgrace and abandon the cause of equal rights now and forever? The directors of the mills should take care of our sister operatives crushed by their machinery. A girl broke her arm in one of the weaving rooms and never received help from the corporation. My cousin Jane came to me last week so upset. I am sick, what shall I do? I have worked three years straight through the winter snow and spring in bloom. To thy feet it had my loom. Doctor said it would be best if I could just stay home and rest. But doctor doesn't seem to know that I have nowhere to go. I am sick, what shall I do? Who can I tell my troubles to? If a boss man sees my scarlet face, Will a new girl take my place? I never did give up before. I was the fastest on my floor. Did everything they asked me to. Now I am sick. What shall I do? This is the feeling of a thousand females. Our merciful Father gave us all minds capable of improvement. We must throw off the shackles that bind us in ignorance and servitude and prevent us from rising to the place for which God designed us. Shall we, workers of America, where democracy claims to be the principle by which we are governed, see evil daily increasing, separating more widely the favored few and unfortunate many without one exertion to stop it? No! Let the daughters of New England kindle the spark of philanthropy in every heart until its brightness fills the whole earth. We, the undersigned laborers of Lowell, in view of the alarming effects of the number of hours we are to labor upon our health and happiness, anxiously and hopefully invoke your aid and assistance in removing this oppressive burden. By enacting such a law as will prohibit all incorporated companies from employing one set of hands more than 10 hours per day. We also call your attention to an article in the factory regulations which is the cause of much injustice and reads as follows. All persons seeking employment into the company are to be engaged for 12 months, and those who leave sooner or do not comply to these regulations will not be entitled to a regular discharge. 
this regulation is becoming every day more grievous, leading to monopoly and wrong. Thus, we consider a people's legislature duty-bound to protect the weak and defenseless against the combined strength of capital and organized power. Massachusetts legislature, with the Honorable William Schuler presiding, will now hear testimony on the matter of hours of labor. A few years ago, no girl worked more than two looms. Now we work four and sometimes five. We make a few cents more an hour, but the work has been doubled. We feel our overtasked systems giving way, yet we resolve to toil a little longer but nature cannot be cheated. Immediate measure must be taken to bring about the 10 hour system for factory workers who are continually inhaling cotton dust and lamp smoke. I've been an operative more than 10 years. My health suffered in less than two. I was often advised to leave, but duty to my parents bound me. Their financial security was accomplished with the loss of my health. <sighs> Long hours of labor, the short time allowed for meals, and the large number who occupy our boarding houses all contribute. There is not enough time or space for bathing in our homes. It is as necessary as food or sleep. Our skin becomes encrusted with cotton dust. Many of us fall prey to consumption and find an early grave. If the operatives of Lowell are the virtuous daughters of New England, is it necessary to shut us up at night, six in a room? Are we not qualified to find lodging for ourselves? We must allow every girl ample time and room to bathe once in each day. Otherwise, disease will be the consequence. Those who keep the boarding houses do all in their power to make the stay of the girls pleasant, but too many are made to occupy the same quarters. The air in the workroom is not wholesome. There are 293 oil lamps lit in the room when evening work is required. The noxious fumes fill our lungs. About 150 people work there. Every day there are at least six girls out from sickness. Some days as many as 30. The Lowell Corporation prevents any person from being employed in another corporation. 
if, in the opinion of the overseer, she is not suitable for employment. It doesn't matter what induces this opinion. It could be favoritism or even lechery on the part of the overseer. A sister operative of mine was employed at one of the Lowell factories and left because she thought she could labor with much better satisfaction elsewhere. But on application for work at another mill, she was denied because the overseer of the mill she had left had announced to the other overseers that she was not worthy of work. She applied to every mill in the city, but was denied. I came to Lowell eight years ago and worked for a year and a half. I left on account of ill health and was out of work for over two years. Then I went to work in the boot mills and have remained there ever since. Over the last eight years, I have lost about three years of work to ill health. Our preacher made a tour of the Granite State Prison and asked about the hours of labor and found them fewer than what we operatives work by about two hours. This is what the judges of our courts call hard labor in sentences of the law. Fathers of our own free New England, are you not the sons of the fathers of 1776? If so, let your voices be heard in thunder tones, and let your hands reach out and save us from the evils that threaten us now. Representative William Schuler, who presides over the Massachusetts legislature, faces a tough bid for re-election this year. Schuler is merely a corporate machine, so we will use our influences to keep him here in the city of Spindles and not trouble Boston folks with him. We just received word that Schuler has lost the election. Resolved that the members of this association thank the voters of Lowell for consigning William Schuler to the obscurity he so justly deserves. As I went to walk in one fine summer's morning, the birds on the branches they sweetly did sing The young men and ladies together were sporting Going down to the factory their work to begin I spied one among them she was fairer than any her cheek like the red rose that none can excel. Her skin like the lily that grows in the valley. And she was a hard-working factory girl. I stepped on up to her more closely to view her. When on me she cast a proud look of disdain, saying, Young men have manners and do not come near me. I work for my living and think it's no shame. I don't mean to scorn you, in fact I adore you. But grant me one favor, love, where do you dwell? Kind sir, you'll excuse me, for now I must leave you. For yonder's the sound of my factory bell. Although she refused me, I 
went back the next day. But not to play games or to settle a score. For I was a lost scoundrel drawn to this sharp beauty. And each day we talked just a little bit more. She told of her long days of work at the factory. And her hope too took root in my heart. She said, Working folks need shorter hours and fair wages. Otherwise, work will tear souls and bodies apart. For nine months, we courted through snow, spring, and summer. I strung her along, though the whole time I knew that I'd already promised my heart to another. And the factory girl and I soon would be through. So I married a lady who lived in a mansion. Though my heart was not in it, my word I fulfilled. But I never stopped yearning to see my sweet Delia Beg forgiveness from her and say I loved her still On the day that I finally walked back to the factory All the pilgrims were down in the churchyard instead and then I saw a coffin, and then someone told me She had come home exhausted and died in her bed Yes, it's true that I loved her, but now I have lost her Yet she taught me so much of the working folk's world now I rage against slavery and struggle for justice. It's the gift I've been left by the factory girl. Now I rage against slavery and struggle for justice. It's the gift I've been left by the Company bylaws dictate that those in the employ of the companies are required to be constant in their attendance at some regular place of worship, and those that neglect the strict regulation shall not be employed. We hear much of the subject of benevolence among the wealthy and so-called Christian part of the community. Have we not cause to question the sincerity of those who talk benevolence in the parlor, but compel their help to labor a mean pittance in the kitchen? Is it strange that we should stay away from churches where men filling the chief seats look upon us as inanimate machines made to serve their interests? Can it be reasonably supposed that those who are called to task at 5.30 every morning and labor until 7 o'clock at night 
be expected to maintain proper attendance at church? These days, no washing is done by boarding house matrons, except the mill dress. And there is much additional labor in keeping a wardrobe and church going order, which we have no time to perform. Another objection arises from the fact that the aristocratic class has ordained a standard in dress which we are unable to follow. Yes, those who have been in Lowell but a short time, who venture out to church in their plain country dress, are stared upon and laughed at. These causes are a sufficient apology for not attending church. We would thank God most devoutly if there could be found a house of worship where the gospel could be heard and heeded by every mill boss and baron. Dear Father, I have given notice at the mill and will soon leave for Atlantic, New Jersey. My friend Carrie and her husband Frank are part of a model community there with about 125 persons. The editor of the New York Tribune, Horace Greeley, is a shareholder there, although he does not live there. I can get better pay without working such long hours. There is no such word as aristocracy there, unless there is a real superiority of skill. Members pay only for what they eat, with most of the food being grown on the grounds. One can join with or without funds, and can leave any time they choose. Frank has been there since fall and is very pleased with it. Both men and women can get the same pay for the same work. In Lowell, men can sometimes get double the pay that women do, and members can get educational privileges for free. While I started my stay in Lowell with the hopes of bettering myself, I found that my significant efforts only served the betterment of my employer. I will miss my friends, but hope to become part of a true community elsewhere. Your fond daughter, Harriet. The abolitionist and poet John Greenleaf Whittier visited Lowell and reminded us of those less fortunate. There were acres of girlhood in Lowell, beauty reckoned by the square rod or miles by long measure. The young, graceful, the gay, the flowers gathered from a thousand hillsides and green valleys of New England fair, unveiled nuns of industry, sisters of thrift and charity, fighting the sin of slavery, the sunshine of their youth and love. Mr. Whittier's visit galvanized our belief in the anti-slavery cause. It is strange to think that a cause like that should not have always been our country's cause. Our country, our own free nation, but anti-slavery sentiments were then regarded by many as traitorous heresies, and those who held them did not expect to be popular. If the vote of the mill girls had been taken, it would doubtless have been unanimous on the anti-slavery side. But those were also the days when a woman was not expected to give, or even to have, an opinion on subjects of public interest. One of Mr. Whittier's poems was set to music, and perfectly expressed his sentiments.
In 1850, Senator Clemens of Alabama stated in Congress that the Southern slaves are better off than the Northern male operatives. I challenge this statement in a letter to the New York Tribune. Mr. Clemens, sir, I have read several questions which you have asked concerning the Mill Girls. I deem it proper that we should answer for ourselves. I offered a detailed description of the Mill Girls' age of employment, hours, pay, health, diet, education, future prospects, and freedom to seek other employment. Then I focused on Clemens' most egregious claim. Let us see whether the Southern slaves are better off than the Northern male operatives. While the Mill Girls hope to improve the circumstances under which we work and live, we have most that is necessary for health and comfort. Do the slaves have more? It is in the power of every young girl who comes here to work to have some access to education. Have the slaves that privilege? By giving two weeks notice, we can leave our jobs to go home, visit friends, or travel. Some of us have visited the White Mountains, Niagara Falls, and the city of Washington. Can a slave leave when they please and go where they please? Some of the operatives of this city have become teachers in your state. Why do you send here for teachers if your slaves are better off than they? Shame on the man who would stand up in the United States Senate and say that the slaves of the South are better off than the operatives of New England. Such a man is not fit for office in any free country. Are we torn from our friends and kindred, sold and driven about like cattle, chained and whipped, and not allowed to speak one word in self-defense? We can appeal to the laws for redress, but the slaves cannot. Mr. Clemens, I most earnestly invite you and all other Southern men who wish to know anything about us to come and see us. We will greet you with all the politeness in our power at number 61 Kirk Street. In closing, I must say that I pity not only the slave, but the slave owner. May God, in all his infinite mercy, convince all pro-slavery men of the great sin of holding their fellow man in bondage. May he turn their hearts from cruelty and oppression to love. Please excuse me for omitting the word honorable before your name. I cannot apply titles where they are not deserved. Petitions to Congress for the abolition of slavery were circulated every year among the Mill Girls and received thousands of signatures. The Mill Girls came to realize that they were part of the same system of oppression as the slaves. The cotton crop that was picked by unpaid, imprisoned workers in the South was processed by underpaid young women in the North. The profits of the mill barons and the slave owners were growing, even while the rest of the country was suffering financial setbacks. There is an unholy union between the cotton planters and the flashmongers of Louisiana and Mississippi, and the cotton spinners and traffickers of New England, between the lords of the lash and the lords of the loom. Some of us came to Lowell out of choice, not necessity and could always go back home, or to another city to work, or get married, or move out west. Lowell was a means, not an end. When the mill companies added more capacity, they did not add more company housing. The girls didn't necessarily live together, and lost that bond. As it became less desirable and interesting for farm girls to work in Lowell, they were replaced with Irish immigrant women, men, and children who had no choice but to accept the inadequate pay, long hours, and worsening conditions. The members of the Cottonocracy tell us that we are indeed happy creatures, and how truly grateful and humbly submissive we should be. But it is easier to smooth over a festering system that will swallow up all the laboring classes into servitude than it is to stop this capitalist monster. As the cotton production in Lowell grew, so did the population of slaves in the United States. The slaves who were made in the image of God, who made of one blood all the nations of the earth, were bought and sold like cattle. Families scattered, infants torn from the fond embrace of a mother, and sold by the pound. Although many feared the financial and social consequences of a young country divided by civil war, we could no longer compromise with slaveholders. 
We chose to show our love for the millions of our brothers and sisters dying the living death of slavery. We see that the black man is, after all, our brother. When we learn of his degradation and suffering, we feel our common humanity has suffered, that a grievous wrong has been done to our common nature. We no longer regard slavery as an abstract or an institution and sweep away at once all our apologies for this great American wrong. The Manufacturing Corporation no longer represents a protecting care, a parental influence over its operatives. It is too often a soulless organization, and its members forget that they are morally responsible for the souls and bodies as well as the wages of those whose labor is the source of their wealth. Is it not time that more Christian men and women realize that they have not discharged their whole duty to their employees when they pay monthly wages? That they are also responsible for the dismal surroundings, for the barren and hopeless lives, and for the physical and moral deterioration of them and their children? Corporation should mix a little conscience with their capital and try to bring back this lost Eden which we try to describe. We working girls learned something from the webs of cloth we saw woven around us. Every little thread must take its place as warp or weft. Left to itself, it would only be a loose, useless filament. Trying to wander in a disconnected way among the other threads would make the whole web an inextricable snarl. Each little thread must be as firmly spun as if it were the only one, or the results will be worthless. I cannot speak for my workmates, but I know that because of having lived among them, I'm different from what I should otherwise have been. It is my own fault if I'm not better for my life with them. Male girls went forth from our alma mater, the Lowell factory, with the independence, self-reliance taught in that hard school, and we did our part to perform the useful labors of life. Into whatever vocation we entered, we made practice use of the habits of industry and perseverance learned in those early years. Skilled labor teaches something not to be found in books or in colleges. It builds character and helps us fight well the battle of life. As I recall the throngs of girls who used to pass and repass me on the familiar road to the mill gates, and also the few that I knew so well, those with whom I worked, taught, read, wrote, studied, and worshipped. My thoughts and a heartfelt greeting to them all, wherever in God's beautiful, busy universe they may now be scattered. I am glad I have lived in the world with you. Such is the brief story of the life of everyday working girls. Such as it was then, so it might be today. Some of our paths have crossed, some ran side by side. Yet because I've lived among all of you, my friends, and known the beauty and the power of your lives, I am better than I might have been. Each little thread must be as firmly spun. As if it were the only one And woven tightly to the web as it can be Threads up and down, threads right and left Every loom has its warp and weft And each thread must find its place and go Woven tightly to the web as it can be. 
heads up and down, friends, right and left. Every loop has its warp and web, and each thread must find its place and hold steady. As a strong hit block is woven, so many disconnected threads. Now may we weave a web of freedom and start to mend our broken land. Our broken land. Though be firmly spun and stay straight ahead. Oh, well.